Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, we're almost at the end of our creationism series, so let's dive right into the Foundations of the Earth from our World Upside Down series. Cue up the music, and let's have some fun. According to the world we live in today, the Earth is currently rotating at a speed of over 1,000 miles per hour. According to the Bible, however, the Earth is not moving at all. 1 Chronicles 16 verse 30 says, Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Psalm 93 verse 1 The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established, that it cannot be moved. Psalm 96 verse 10 Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. This is why airplane pilots are able to land their plane without difficulty. The runway is not moving at 1,000 miles per hour beneath them. The runway is standing still. Well, guys, this is a very common problem that we see with flat earthers and now apparently creationists as well. They have absolutely no sense of relative motion. So, for example, if I'm driving in a car going down the road at 60 miles an hour, I'm sitting on my seat in the car. I also am going 60 miles an hour, so my speed relative to the steady speed of my car is zero. Now, this is why when we're on an airplane, we can actually pour ourselves a drink into a glass. The airplane is going 550 miles an hour, but then again, so are we, and our relative speed to the airplane is zero. For example, here in Michigan, the rotational speed of the Earth is approximately 735 miles an hour linear velocity. I'm moving at 735 miles an hour. My chair is moving at 735 miles an hour. That camera is moving at 735 miles an hour. And since we're all moving at the same speed, we're not moving at all relative to each other. So if I were to get up right now and walk towards the door of my studio, that's in an easterly direction. My speed, in absolute terms, would become 737 miles an hour from west to east. However, relative to the room, my walking speed is only 2 miles an hour. The same thing happens on an airplane. When the airplane is sitting on the tarmac, it's going at the exact same speed as the earth underneath its wheels is going. As it takes off, it maintains that speed but it also adds the speed added to it by the thrust of the engines. So this plane starts off with a relative motion to the Earth of zero miles an hour, gets up to 550 miles an hour, gets where it's going, and then lands back on the Earth, again with a relative motion of zero miles an hour. The runway is not running out from underneath it. Now, another common misconception that you will hear in Flat Earth and apparently creationism as well is that if the Earth was rotating at 1,038 miles an hour at the equator, there would be hurricane force winds, triple hurricane, quadruple hurricane force winds, uh, because they assume that the atmosphere is still and the Earth is somehow rotating underneath it. That would indeed cause those winds. However, the atmosphere is rotating right along with the Earth, and the relative speed of the atmosphere to the surface of the Earth is zero. Then we just have to worry about winds going from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Now you can confirm this for yourself in two different ways very easily. The first way is to get yourself a scientific scale, something that reads down to a thousandth of a gram. Then you get a 500 gram reference weight and calibrate it to your location, say here in Michigan so that that scale reads the 500 grams because that's what the reference weight is. Then you take the reference weight and the scale down to Florida and weigh it again. Because the Earth is rotating faster, the closer you get to the equator, 
centrifugal force is greater. And as a result, that 500 gram mass will actually weigh less than 500 grams. Another way that you can do that is take that same reference mass and scale on an airplane. So at your departure location, you calibrate that scale to that reference mass. Then you get in the airplane and you fly west. That's flying against the rotation of the Earth. So as a result, centrifugal force will be a little less and that 500 gram reference mass will weigh more than 500 grams on the scale. Once you get to your destination and you're ready to come back, recalibrate the scale to 500 grams again and fly from west to east. Now you're going with the rotation of the Earth. Centrifugal force will become greater and that mass will actually read less than 500 grams as you fly east. That's called the Utvos effect. The reason the Earth does not move is because it is built upon a foundation. Job 38 verse 4 says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Jeremiah 31 verse 37 Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel, for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Psalm 104 verse 5 Who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever? Well, dude, that's a really good foundation for an argument. Wait a minute. Do you think foundation may have more than one meaning? Which meaning is the Bible using? This is why the Bible says in Job 26 verse 4, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. The reason the earth is hanging upon nothing is because it is resting upon a foundation. And what lies within that foundation? The answer is hell. Well, shoot, that's convenient, isn't it? Amos 9 verse 2 says, Though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Job 11 verse 8. It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Proverbs 15 verse 24 The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. In fact, in the Bible, a group of rebels against God were actually swallowed up by the earth and fell into hell alive. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They, and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. If we've only gone down eight miles, and hell has been opened in the past to swallow up these members of the congregation, how deep is hell? And how does that compare to, say, oil wells or mines? So, where exactly is hell? Can you give me a location of it? For that matter, can you even give me a thickness of the earth? The Bible tells us that Jesus, after dying on the cross for our sins, spent three days and three nights in hell. Acts 2 verse 31 says, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption. Now this may be an inconvenient question, but how exactly do the dead get to hell? Uh, do they have to pay a boatman or something? How do you transport bodies or souls deep into the earth? Do you have to have an open passage or can the soul transverse solid rock? When speaking about Jesus' descent into hell, the Bible says, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? According to this verse, hell is in the lower parts of the earth. You may be wondering, how does the fact that hell is below the ground prove that the earth is flat? The answer is because one of the names for hell in the Bible is the bottomless pit. Now, do we have any information on this bottomless pit? Do we know where it's located? Do we know what direction it goes? It's obviously bottomless, so we don't know how deep it is, but 
Does it go completely through the earth and end up into an area, a void underneath the earth somehow? Is uh, hell a cave? So exactly how does this whole thing work logistically? Is because one of the names for hell in the Bible is the bottomless pit. An example of such a verse is Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. If hell were in the center of a spherical earth, hell could not be a bottomless pit. If you went far enough down, you would eventually reach the other side of the earth. Well, you know, I can't really beat that logic. If you do go straight down through the earth, you will end up on the anapodal point on the other side of the earth and be ascending and come up. Would this suggest perhaps that Jesus went down to the core of the earth and then ascended on the other side of the world? Would that follow along with what the Bible says? Does any point on the earth actually have an antipodal point? Well, yes, it does. So that leaves me a little bit confused. Since the earth is indeed spherical and every point on earth has an antipodal point on the opposite side of the earth, how do you get a bottomless pit? I suppose that if you drilled a hole completely through the earth, you could somehow go down that hole and shoot out the other end into space. But once you got to the core of the earth, you'd stop speeding up and you'd start slowing down on your way out. And you could literally just step off the edge of the pit on the other side. You just go right through and end up at the same velocity you started off with, which was zero relative to the speed of the earth. Now the question becomes is would you experience Coriolis as you went through? I don't know. Put a comment in. But on a flat earth, a bottomless pit would make perfect sense. You know, I have one more problem with this, and that is that if you look at the way he has the flat earth resting over the fires of Hades, would that not imply that we were basically a frying pan? And if fire was underneath us, the heat would rise and heat the bottom of the earth, which would eventually transmit through to the oceans and the land. Wouldn't that heat up the earth? So where does all this heat go? Where does it dissipate to? I don't think that they've thought this all very well through. Uh, it just doesn't obey basic laws of physics that we see in our day-to-day -day lives every time we fry an egg. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. In our next episode, we're going to have a look at the horizon, which is a particular favorite of mine. So hit that like and subscribe down there. We'll see you again next week. And just a couple more of these episodes and we'll be done. Take care, guys.